So the next couple of videos are a little different. Um, I'm pretty busy when this video is uploaded and I was busy for like the two months prior and I'll be busy for the rest of the year. So I'm basically busy after March of 2023. But what I do have time for is bike rides. I do a lot of bike riding. I bike pretty much everywhere. So to make my life easier and to get these book reviews out and going, um, please enjoy videos of me biking around. Um, enjoy the aesthetics. This is basically the slower, calmer version of that TikTok thing where they've got like six things happening in the video while someone talks over it. I don't know. I don't use TikTok. I just seen it once or twice. Anyway, this review was recorded before I decided to start doing this. So future videos, I may talk about the biking, what I'm doing in between the review. But as of right now, I'm just going to talk about the review. All right. Thank you. Today I'll be reviewing... Oh god, I need some water, hold on. Okay, today I'll be reviewing Mariko Koike's Acapella. This isn't the first book I've read from this author. Her most well-read book, The Graveyard Apartment, was the first. The Graveyard Apartment is more along the lines of horror, whereas Acapella is, I guess, just plain fiction, but I think they had pretty much the same vibe. There's a kind of ethereal, ambiguous vibe I get from my limited experience with Japanese authors. There's of course something lost when you translate from one language to another, but it's not unusual to point out that authors of certain nationalities often display, generally speaking of course, a different kind of writing style. For example, it's assumed that American audiences hate ambiguity in narrative, especially when it comes to endings, which is excellently displayed by how many of you still need the ending of Inception explained, or how many people hated The Sopranos ending, which was objectively good and I haven't even watched the show? So, a cappella. Acapella is about Kyoko, a teenage girl living in Sendai in the middle of the anti-war student protests in the late 60s. Kyoko involves herself in some of the demonstration, but like in that way that a teenager does when they don't particularly care deeply about the thing and just kind of get swept up in the counterculture aspect of it. Really, the focus comes when she meets two college men, Wataru and Yunosuke, and Yunosuke's girlfriend Emma. The book actually begins with Kyoko at the age of 40, returning to Sendai after nearly half her life away. Initially, actually, there's a wonderful bit of work by Koike that paints Kyoko as, let's say, unhinged. I close my eyes and turn my face away, refusing to look. But however tightly I shut my eyes, however I twist and turn, second by second the memories revive in images of crystal clarity. I see again every detail of those painful events of 20 years ago. In the northerly city of Sendai lived the first person I ever loved. I knew he didn't love me, but even so I loved him to distraction. Wataru Domoto. That was his name. Wataru. Even now, all these years later, sometimes I'm gripped by the urge to dig a hole in the ground and shout his name into it over and over again like a crazy woman. So like, you read that. You know she hasn't been in the city for 20 years because of this love and then she's like on her way to the bar owned by Wataru's sister and the only reason she knows where this bar is is because she called Wataru's parents after 20 years. The parents were cold, according to Kyoko, because like, yeah, of course they would be like, oh my god, your son's ex-girlfriend from 20 years ago just randomly calls you. So this one page, this all happens on one page, sets the, a nice little stage where you're like, mm, this lady, she's a bit weird, right? So she goes to the bar where Wataru's sister Setsuko works, and Setsuko is also initially cold and wary. Now you, as the reader, are like, oh my god, she's a fucking weirdo stalker. But then Setsuko recognizes her and warms up to her, and our dear narrator Kyoko reveals at the end of chapter 1, in slightly veiled language, that Wataru and Yunosuke are dead. So this is the stage set for the rest of the book. 
Us, the readers, know that these two men are due to die, or something else horrible happening to them. Kyoko is smitten with Wataru right when she meets him, but he seems like distant and constantly keeping secrets. She isn't even sure if he likes her, even though they continue to date. Now, honestly, I was initially thinking Wataru and Yunosuke were gonna be like domestic terrorists protesting the war or whatever, and we were gonna get some Yukio Mishima shit going on. Mishima being actually directly referenced in the book. And、uh, I was mostly wrong, but somewhat right if you are familiar with Yukio Mishima. So, spoilers. Spoilers on a 30 year old book. Initially, Kyoko begins suspecting that her boyfriend is actually in love with his sister, Setsuko, which is honestly far too common of a concept in Japanese media. I don't know why. And that they may or may not be banging. She's not sure they're banging, just want to make that clear. Unable to figure out why he seems so distant from her, her mind goes to some wild places. During a typhoon where Wataru fails to show up at Kyoko's house for a romantic dinner, she braves the storm to go to the shitty little house he and Yunosuke share. So, like, Leading up to this, literally, she's in the storm. I'm reading this, she's getting there. The, the suspense and the dread is building, and it just suddenly occurs to me oh, Wataru is not banging his sister, he's banging Yunosuke. And ding, 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 Kyoko catches Yunosuke and Wataru in the act and runs off, upset and betrayed. So basically, Kyoko loves Wataru. Wataru says he loves Kyoko, but he also loves Yunosuke. And they promised they wouldn't keep this relationship, but had a supposed moment of weakness. Yunosuke supposedly also loves his girlfriend Emma, who is, of course, madly in love with him. Kyoko is understandably anguished, wondering how she can compete against the man, wondering if Wataru even loves her and what to do. After a brief break in their relationship on the day they try to reconcile, Kyoko learns Emma is pregnant with Yunosuke's child. So, Kyoko battles with herself here, wanting to tell Emma that her man is gay or possibly bisexual, and wanting to selfishly keep this a secret in the hopes that this will keep Yunosuke away from Wataru. She ends up choosing the latter. She reconciles with Wataru, and their relationship continues. Emma insists she's keeping the baby even though Yunosuke doesn't want to, and that they will get married, which Yunosuke also doesn't want to. This culminates in Yunosuke murdering Emma, something Wataru later reveals to Kyoko that he had been aware of and had even partially planned this with him. In Wataru's guilt and grief, he takes his life while Yunosuke goes to jail for Emma's murder. The end. Well, not like the end, the end, but at that point in the story, there's barely like 15 pages left in the book. For me, the book meandered during Kyoko and Wataru's awkward and stilted courtship. And then we finally pedal to the meddled secret gay relationship and horrible murder, bam, done, book over. Kyoko, the 40 year old Kyoko, decides not to tell Setsuko the truth for why Wataru committed suicide. Throughout the book, there is a through line of Kyoko being unable to emotionally open up to the female friends in her life, and her retrospective narration that these were all perhaps fatal mistakes. That if she had told one of her high school boyfriends her hesitance about her boyfriend, if she told Emma about their boyfriends, perhaps things would be different. In the final page of the book, Kyoko speaks to one of these high school friends, laughing and joking. Kyoko's eyes fill with tears, but she does not cry, something she never does in front of any of her friends. Whether it's 20 years ago or now, whether to Setsuko or her high school friends, Kyoko remains unable to fully open up to a person. There's definitely some background to this book about this time in Japanese history, music, how this fits in the grand scheme of Mariko Koike's works, but I am too stupid for all of these things. This is a deliciously melancholy book about an adult looking back on their tragic romance, a time that is nostalgic but perhaps more fraught than her own very normal, very boring adulthood. This is one of those fiction novels that I imagine people are talking about when they say they don't like literary fiction because it's about. Some old creepy professor banging his young female student while divorcing his wife. 
Despite its complex seeming political background, this is primarily about these four young people, their romantic entangling, sexuality, and mental health issues. For all the drama and the tragic ending, it's very mundane subject matter. It's not Yukio Mishima trying to overthrow the government and committing seppuku with his gay lover, right? So final decision, is acapella a keep? Does it spark joy? Does it earn a spot on my bookshelves? N no, ultimately no. I would say if you wanted to get into Mariko Koike's work, try out the graveyard apartment first. I highly recommend it. The graveyard apartment is on my bookshelf. I love it. If she really scratches your itch, try out acapella and any of her other works available in your language. It's not that I didn't like this. I did. Just not enough. Bookshelves take up a lot of space, you know. We're 0-3 on the keeper cell while I finally read something that breaks the streak. Until next time.